Hello everyone and welcome to Pax Britannica. My name is Wesley Livesey, and for the last five years I've been the creator of the History of the Great War podcast. The First World War began in 1914, and over the next four years it would cause destruction and death on a scale never before seen in human history. It would also bring an end to the period of history known as the Pax Britannica. If you would like to learn more about the cataclysmic events that occurred in the aftermath of Pax Britannica and the way in which it reshaped the world, search for History of the Great War and join us on a journey through the war to end all wars. I'll now hand it back over to Sam for your regularly scheduled programming. Welcome to Pax Britannica. Episode 17. The sun is gone out. Welcome back to Pax Britannica. Last week, we saw the last gasp of James's first English Parliament. When James had summoned it as he began his reign in London, he had hoped and expected two things. Their support for his grand project of political union between England and Scotland, and money. As we've seen many times so far, he was frustrated on both accounts. Parliament could not countenance a union of equal kingdoms, and refused to make the concessions in law, politics, and finance that such an equal union would require. After half a century of the miserly spinster Elizabeth, the extravagance of James and his family appalled the commons. His genuine financial needs mixed with his desire for opulence and his generosity to his friends, and hampered any argument in favour of more revenue. That many of these friends, into whose pockets the wealth of England was flowing, were Scots, only added salt to the wound in the eyes of the commons. The final attempt to wring some financial reforms out of the commons, the Earl of Salisbury's Great Contract, had crumpled by the end of 1610. The concessions the Crown was offering were too few for the commons, and the behaviour of James too overreaching. From James's perspective, Parliament was borderline seditious. His finances were a matter of realm security, and their open hatred of his Scottish courtiers was beyond the pale. When the fifth session of Parliament was prorogued in the winter of 1610, it would not meet again. James dissolved it in February 1611. His trust in parliaments was broken, and he would never be so patient with them again. But the king's purse was still worryingly light. His debts were still in the hundreds of thousands of pounds, and inflation hadn't gone away, and was still gradually reducing the real value of his ordinary revenues. The Great Contract might have gone some way to fix this, but such radical changes had been rejected. Salisbury, never truly out of favour, even after his project failed, was on the case. He entreated his king to make another attempt to win Parliament over, but his efforts were wasted. Instead, Salisbury turned back to royal rights. The impositions had been one such method, but it was not Salisbury's only idea. Among others, in 1611, the king reintroduced a title, the Baronet, which was essentially a hereditary knighthood. How did one earn this honour? Brave deeds, dutiful service, no need for any of that. For the low price of £1,065, candidates were made baronets, with their title passing to their eldest son on their death. This was, in many ways, genius. The title came with no land, or other physical rewards like a salary, just the honour, meaning James could bestow as many as he wished, 
because honour was endless, and 88 baronetcies were granted between May and November 1611. The money, which was a substantial amount, was ostensibly to support the plantation projects in Ireland. No one could have a problem with that, surely? Further, it helped ease domestic tensions. At least a quarter of those made a baronet between May and November were recusant Catholics, or otherwise tarnished. According to Professor Croft, four were even relatives of the gunpowder plotters. By selling, I mean bestowing, these titles on these potentially seditious subjects, James was making it clear to all that he considered them loyal. They were loyal enough to purchase this title, and so their loyalty was beyond doubt. Of course, the remaining three quarters were otherwise Protestant gentlemen, who were eager to receive a title. Many of these baronetcies still exist. One recipient was Nicholas Bacon, half-brother to Sir Francis Bacon, whose descendant holds the title of Premier Baronet to this day. Perhaps Salisbury would have succeeded in changing his prince's mind on Parliament, or found another way to stabilise royal finances, had he had more time. But throughout the year, his health became worse. In August, the royal physician diagnosed Salisbury with two tumours, and prescribed a healthy diet and exercise. There was little else he could do, aside from pray that they were benign. In December 1611, he was so ill that he passed almost all of his daily work of the treasury to his underling, Sir Julius Caesar, but he did not retire. In February 1612, he was on death's door, and government business ground to a halt, so central was he to proceedings. Yet he recovered, if only slightly, and was visited by the royal family. More a sign of how great his influence was, even away from court, the court followed him, as petitioners and visitors seeking favour came to his sickbed. The king's favourite, and maybe lover, Robert Carr, Viscount of Rochester, wrote to Salisbury to thank him for his support over the last few years, and Sir Francis Bacon, who was not particularly keen on his cousin, sent him flattering letters and promised his service. In April, Salisbury left London for Bath in the hope that the springs there would help him recover. His son, William, rushed to visit him there, and both the king and queen sent gifts and messages. The king sent, quote, a fair diamond, set or rather hung square in a gold ring, without a foil, and a message accompanying it to this purpose, that the favour and affection he bore him was and should be ever as the form and matter of that ring, endless, pure, and most perfect. Everyone knew he was dying, including the man himself. He wrote to Northampton just before he left Bath to say goodbye. On his way from Bath to London, Robert Cecil, Earl of Salisbury, died in the town of Marlborough, Wiltshire, on the 24th of May, 1612. He had followed his father into Queen Elizabeth's service, and took his place after his death. He had survived coups intent on his death, and by his negotiations a Scottish king inherited the English throne, without any bloodshed. Salisbury had protected James from plots against his life, and done his very best to bring Parliament and King into agreement. He had served his King ably, and been generously rewarded, but his advancement had been his early death. Perhaps a lesser workload might have given him a few more years, but even with his time approaching, he did not stop working. He was responsible for a range of grand buildings, some of which still survive, such as Hatfield House. His two children, William and Francis, may not have appreciated that, as the expense left debts of more than £37,000, although his executors had largely dealt with this by 1617, when William was one of the richest aristocrats in the kingdom. There was some debate over whether Salisbury had lost his status and position after the Great Contract, 
but to my mind, it doesn't appear so. His enemies were many, and after his death, he became the target of plenty of criticism. But that's the rub. After his death. Northampton, Bacon, and others kept the bulk of their feelings hidden. After his death, Northampton received Salisbury's position at the Treasury, and then showed his true feelings, writing of his glee that Salisbury was dead and that the little lord was in hell. With feelings like this, if Salisbury had truly been on the outs before his death, surely they would have leapt at the chance to destroy him. Instead, they kept stum. Eric N. Lindquist puts it nicely, quote, The crucial fact was the failure of his own health. His decline was physiological, not political. Salisbury kept his three great offices until his death. He was still the centre of government to whom petitioners and foreign dignitaries flocked. The king, queen, and the royal children all visited him in his final days, showering him with gifts. His supposed chief rival, Robert Carr, benefited greatly from his influence over the king, and the evidence of his hostility is suspect, while after his death, he inherited only a fraction of his power. No one inherited more than a fraction of his power. No one else could match Salisbury in the king's trust or incompetence. I might be coming across as a bit of a Salisbury fanboy, but it's hard not to. He helped win a kingdom for a king, too, actually, and helped him keep them. He worked himself to death and died at the comparatively young age of 48. Bonjour, comment ça va? Happy New Year, everyone. Yes, it's that time of the year when people make resolutions. They want to read more, exercise more, or learn a new language. Clearly, I've chosen the latter. And I have Babbel, the language learning app that sold more than 10 million subscriptions, to help me. So, it's French for me in 2022, but like all of you, my schedule is already full. No problem. Babbel is fun, engaging, and its bite-sized language lessons, about 15 minutes, are for real-world use. In other words, it's doable and practical. My two favorite things. And you know that you're getting the best with Babbel, as it was created by over 100 language experts with proven effectiveness, and its speech recognition technology will help improve your pronunciation and accent. And there are 14 languages to choose from. As I am a child at heart, I like Babbel's podcasts, games, stories, and videos, not to mention the live classes. But best of all, to put you at ease, there is a 20-day money-back guarantee. All reward, no risk. Start your new language learning journey today with Babbel. Right now, when you purchase a three-month Babbel subscription, you'll get an additional three months for free. That's six months for the price of three. Just go to Babbel.com and use promo code RecordedHistory. That's B-A-B-B-E-L dot com, code RecordedHistory. Babbel language for life. During this time, Arbella Stewart, who had been the focus for plotters early in James's reign as a possible replacement for the king, once again enters our narrative. She had been summoned to court by James early in his reign, partly to keep her and her claim to the throne close at hand. Arbella had been part of Queen Anne's household and was thoroughly unimpressed by the day-to-day -day of such a lifestyle. The late Alison Plowden wrote that, quote, The scholarly and fastidious Arbella Stewart had been amazed to find herself being expected to play children's games when she first came to court. Arbella made the questionable choice in June 1610 to secretly marry without the king's permission. This would have been a dangerous act no matter the circumstances. After Henry, Charles, and Elizabeth, she was next in line to the throne, after all. Her marriage was a matter for the government, not idle fancy, and the court had declined marriage proposals from foreign princes as well as English and Scots nobles. So it was a matter of some concern when Arbella chose to marry 
William Seymour, the future Duke of Somerset. That family name and that title might sound familiar. Seymour was the great-grandson of Edward Seymour, Lord Protector during the reign of Edward VI, and his father was, according to Henry VIII's will, the next in line after the death of Elizabeth. This document had been ignored or followed depending on political necessity ever since the man himself died. Elizabeth's own position was due to ignoring it, and it was ignored when James acceded to the throne. Seymour's marriage to Lady Arbella was the equivalent of Mary Queen of Scots' marriage to Lord Darnley, in that it combined two strong claims in one marriage. James was not pleased. Arbella was tainted by her association with the plots against James's life, even if she had had nothing to do with them. With the marriage revealed, both husband and wife were imprisoned, Seymour in the tower, and Arbella in a courtier's home. After a year in captivity, the two sprung their plot to escape. Seymour managed to cross the channel, and would later return to high status, but Arbella was not so fortunate. She was captured at sea, and took her husband's place in the tower. She would remain there until her death four years later. Princess Elizabeth's marriage was a principal concern over these years. As mentioned in earlier episodes, her suitors were legion. The rulers and heirs of Savoy, Sweden, France, and a range of German princedoms all made bids for her hand. Even Philip III of Spain, recently widowed in 1611, had tentatively offered himself. But by the time Arbella was being led into the tower, the likely candidate had been decided. Frederick V, Count Palatine of the Rhine. There were a few reasons that Frederick had won out. His dynasty could be traced back six centuries, more than a match for the Stuart prestige. He was an elector of the Holy Roman Empire, one of the few who chose the emperor. The Palatinate was both wealthy and strategically important, stretching between the Rhine and the Danube. And he was a Protestant, and a natural balance to the feared Catholic-Habsburg-French alliance. With Europe splitting along denominational lines, in 1609 James had written his premonition, and addressed it to the Holy Roman Emperor Rudolf II and the rest of Christendom's monarchs. All English dignitaries were to present them at their respective courts, which caused something of an embarrassment for many due to its content. James disavowed papal claims to have authority over monarchs, and warned Catholic rulers that their clergy represented a dangerous fifth column that would act against their rights if the Pope deemed it so. To try and head off war, James suggested a general council of the church to bring all sides to the table. All good, jaw-jaw instead of war-war and all that. The embarrassment for the dignitaries came when James added a lengthy portion of his premonition to describing exactly how the Pope was the Antichrist. Why can't we all just get along? But also, leaders of the Catholic League, don't forget that the Pope is the servant of the devil, okay? So, perhaps unsurprisingly, his call for peace was ignored, and Europe's rulers divided further into camps. In this context, an alliance with a powerful Protestant realm was of vital importance, and the Palatinate fit the bill nicely. The negotiations were lengthy, so much so that Frederick's mother was concerned that Elizabeth would be married off elsewhere, but by May 1612, the final arrangements began. Elizabeth would have a dowry of £40,000, and a stipend to keep her in the lifestyle she was used to. The Palatine was rich, but England was richer. She would take a household of 36 men and 13 women, which Frederick would provide for. If Frederick died, she would receive £10,000 a year 
and have complete autonomy over where she lived, and importantly for James, the marriage of her children was to require the consent of James or his heirs. She was third in line to the thrones of England, Scotland, and Ireland. The person sitting on those thrones needed a say in his potential successor. In July, the Count Palatine's right-hand man, Meinhard von Schoenberg, arrived with a request from Frederick to visit. Schoenberg brought with him letters from the Count addressed to both Elizabeth and Henry, but got them mixed up. Other than this, the visit went smoothly, aside from Queen Anne, making her opinions of the match quite known. According to Plowden, Schoenberg returned to his master full of tales of the richness of the Stuart court, and a warning that the Count would need to learn to dance. Frederick arrived on the 16th of October. Suffering from that most normal of travel problems, he had lost his luggage. The ship with his clothes had been delayed, and to his horror, he would have to make his first impressions while wearing his travelling clothes. If anyone has ever felt underdressed, spare a thought for poor Frederick. The teenager made his way to Whitehall by boat, and the entire city had turned out to welcome him. Full barges filled the river, and crowds on the banks, all to glimpse the prince who would marry their princess. An 80-gun salute echoed from the tower, and the Prince of Wales, along with an entourage of high nobility, all in their finest garb, greeted him as he disembarked at the Palace of Whitehall and was led inside to meet his future wife and parents-in-law. Again, 16 years old, meeting his future in-laws with an entire kingdom of notables watching in the equivalent of jeans and a t-shirt. Oh, and the in-laws are literal royalty. Still, Frederick made a good impression. He bowed to the king, kissed the queen's hand, saluted the Prince of Wales, and then went to kiss the hem of Elizabeth's gown. Instead, she curtsied, preventing him from being too humble, and then he kissed her hand as well. There was glowing praise all round for the prince. John Finette, the master of ceremonies, wrote that he becomes himself well and is very well lied of all while John Chamberlain said he carried himself with that assurance and so well and gracefully that he won much love and commendation. The king clearly liked him, and even the queen, who didn't approve of the match, was coming around. Perhaps most importantly, considering this was a marriage, Elizabeth was pleased with the match also. For most of his time in England, Frederick was in Elizabeth's presence, rejecting offers of hunting or sport in favour of staying with her. So far, so good. But on the 29th of October, a banquet was held in honour of Frederick, with the entire royal family in attendance. Well, almost the entire family. Prince Henry did not attend, as he was down with a sickness some kind of fever, and was laid up in bed. Events over the next week, such as a play, were cancelled. His family visited him, and he seemed to be improving, only for the symptoms to return with a vengeance. The prince was delirious, with a fever, diarrhoea, and an erratic pulse. The physicians forbade any further visits, fearing that perhaps it was contagious, not even from Princess Elizabeth, who had been asked for by Henry specifically. She tried, nevertheless, but was prevented from reaching his bedside. Henry persisted for a week, but on the 6th of November, 1612, he fell into a coma. By sunset, Henry Frederick Stuart, the Prince of Wales, Duke of the Rothesay, Lord of the Isles, Duke of Cornwall, and Earl of Chester, among others, heir apparent to the kingdoms of England, Scotland, and Ireland, was dead. He was 18 years old, and had probably died of typhoid fever. As might be expected of the sudden death of the Crown Prince, the eulogies came thick and fast. The title of this episode is from a sermon, The Lamentations for the Death of the Late Illustrious Prince Henry, which compares Henry's death to the sun being extinguished. 
Henry's reputation was only bolstered by his early death. It was seen, especially by those writing after the reign of his brother Charles, as a great loss of potential. Of course, we have no way of knowing exactly what type of king Henry would have been, but we looked at Prince Henry in detail in episode 13. He was zealous, confident, and gregarious. How would he have handled Parliament? Would he take the same path as his brother would? We'll never know, but it is an interesting thought. Next week, we'll look at the fallout of Henry's early death, cover the marriage of Elizabeth to the Elector, and catch up with events overseas. Thank you to my House of Lords, Her Grace the Duchess of Devon Michelle Gersich, the Royal Headsman, executed today, the Most Honourable the Marchioness of Scullion, Lady Jennifer, the Right Honourable Countess of Cornwall, Belinda Clarence, the Earl of Hereford, Christopher Remo, the Earl of Somerset, Brendan Bonner, the Countess of Shrewsbury, Elaine Dickens, the Countess of Surrey, Jean Buckley, and the Earl of Oxford, Christopher Grogan. In the near future, perhaps before this episode goes live, adverts will begin being dynamically inserted into Pax Britannica episodes. I hope that the ads won't be too disruptive, I have very little control over how they actually sound. They shouldn't be, but in case they are, um, every member of the House of Lords, from the one dollar tier onwards has access to a advert free feed so that is an option for those so inclined remember to give the history of the great war a listen i'm currently listening through the series on the paris peace conference which is fantastic and i'm i can't get enough i'm looking for stuff to do around the flat so that i you know can listen to more of it thank you again to my house of lords to everyone who follows me on Facebook and Twitter, to Sounds Like an Earful for the music used in this episode, and to you for listening. <laughs>